Okay. I think we have everybody in here. So welcome. Thank you for being here for the latest event in our 50 years of women at Fairfield celebration. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. Throughout this anniversary year, we have been thrilled to highlight so many accomplished women, and our three panelists this evening are certainly no exception. Leading this evening's conversation is Dr. Aaron Weinstein, who joined Fairfield three years ago as a member of Fairfield's politics department, and he is now the director of our pre-law advising program. I know some of his students have registered for this event, and I feel confident they will learn a lot from this evening's conversation. Before we get things started, just two quick housekeeping notes. First, I ask that you please keep your microphones muted throughout the event just to minimize distractions for our speakers and for our other guests. And second, we encourage you to use the chat feature in Zoom and submit questions for our panelists. And we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible as time allows at the end of the evening. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Weinstein to get us started. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you all very much for coming, um, at least for us here on campus. This is the first night of our spring break. Uh, not spring break, sorry, Easter break, I misspoke. So um, I am pleased to be here. I'm excited to be here. Um, really quickly, a little about myself, for those of you who haven't um, met me yet. Uh, my name is Aaron Weinstein, and I teach in politics. Uh, politics, of course, is in the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, I study American politics and political theory. I focus on political thought, specifically religious political thought and 20th century political thought and conservatism and liberalism. Uh, I also uh, have the uh, honor to serve as the director of the pre-law advising program. Uh, many of my students are here as well tonight. I do see them and I welcome them all as along with the alums and the parents and the other students. Um, so real quick, I'm gonna start shutting up and I'm gonna turn things over to our wonderful alumni um, who are here as panelists. Uh, so we have, and I'll just quickly introduce all of them, all of whom, by the way, uh, former uh, College of Arts and Science alums. Uh, Nicole Camporiale, or Camporiale is a graduate of Fairfield in 2012. Um, while she was here, she was a politics major and had a communications and studio art, or sorry, uh, concentration in studio arts and Italian studies. Also captain of the D1 women's cross country team. Uh, she attended Quinnipiac Law School. She graduated in honors in 2015. Um, she is now partner at Wiley, Etter, and Doyen. Um, and uh, she works in transactional law. And in 2017, she was nominated by her peers and recognized as New England Super Lawyers Rising Star. Uh, and she is in the, admitted to the bar in Connecticut and in New Jersey. Um, our second speaker is Ellen Morgan. Um, Ellen graduated from Fairfield uh, in 1986, where she majored in psychology. She was born and raised in Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, she attended Tulane Law School, uh, graduating in 1989. Um, in 1992, she became the first woman and first black assistant town attorney in Stratford. Um, she has extensive training in mediation, having attended the Center for Mediation and Law at Columbia, the Dispute Settlement Center, Inc. in Norwalk, and Child Protection Session of Connecticut's Juvenile Court System. Uh, she practices uh, family law, including elderly law, juvenile law, Social Security, and many other areas she can tell us about. Um, and we also have with us Kelly McClure. And Kelly graduated Fairfield in 1981, where she majored in political science. She attended St. Mary's University School of Law. She also attended Oxford University's law program. And over the course of 25 years, she has specialized in family law, representing numerous individuals and representing them very, very well um, and winning uh, uh, sort of uh, very sort of uh, good um, outcomes for them um, in terms of the settlements. Uh, Kelly has numerous awards, and there are too many to list, but I'll just give you a few. Uh, Best Law Firms by U.S. News and World Report, Top Rated Women Leaders in the Law by American Lawyer Magazine, and Top Attorney in North America in Who's Who, and all of that is just this last year. Uh, so um, with this, I will turn things over to our speakers, uh, first to Nicole, and then to Kelly, oh, sorry, then to Ellen, and then to Kelly. Um, and we are going to um, have them briefly introduce themselves, tell them a little bit about their experience here at Fairfield, um, and specifically thinking about um, mentorship to begin with. So what it was like here on Fairfield on campus, the mentors that you had, specifically, I would hope to hear about any women in particular who were mentors to you, um, and then what brought you to law school and beyond. So we'll start with Nicole. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. First off, I'm really grateful to be a part of this panel with such 
other great female attorneys. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, a little bit about myself, I, as Dr. Weinstein said, I graduated from Fairfield in 2012. So I would be the youngest member of the panel today, um, which is why I feel so lucky. But after, um, I, I actually am originally from New Jersey. I moved to Connecticut to go to Fairfield and then to law school at Quinnipiac. Uh, so I'm still living in Connecticut now. Um, I did major in politics. I actually started out as a business major uh, and to give the business school all the credit that it's due, it was tough. And at that point I realized, you know, I, I do want to focus on my goal of going to law school and becoming a lawyer. So I transitioned to the wonderful uh, College of Arts and Sciences, focused on, you know, growing my, my skills in reading, writing, analytics, all that. Um, and it, it really did help propel me into the career that I have now. Um, you know, I utilized advisors within the the school at Fairfield. Um, I think that was probably the best part about Fairfield is that there's these open door policies. You can always go and ask the questions that you need to ask. Transitioning from the business school to the School of Arts and Sciences was pretty seamless. Um, and it really allowed me to, you know, accomplish my goals. Um, as Dr. Weinstein said, I also ran cross country. I was the captain um, of the team, which you know, as part of the growth of leadership skills that I had, learning hard work, dedication. Um, I can't point to any teacher in particular um, or advisor, but I think that what I want to point out is that the pre-law program now is really a great tool for that. And I wished I had it then, and I'm so grateful that Fairfield now has such a great pre-law program so that students like me can find that advisor, find that mentor, and get to law school. Um, so, you know, after that, I, you know, really enjoyed my time at Fairfield. I met my husband at Fairfield. We're stag mates and, you know, <laughs> it's a very common thing. Um, I, I went to law school. I went to Quinnipiac. Um, just spent a lot of time there focusing on my goal of becoming a family lawyer, which Kelly is a great one, but I didn't wind up enjoying that as much as I thought. So now I'm actually practicing law, um, still transactional work, but estate planning, so wills and trusts and things like that, um, elder law, which is actually my the favorite part of my practice, um, and probate work. So, you know, I've been practicing law for, I think, five, six years now. Time is flying. Um, and I just really enjoy what I do. So I'm, I welcome all of your questions um, about any aspect of Fairfield, getting to law school, law school itself, being a lawyer. Um, and I know we have some questions lined up that I'm excited to answer. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, and actually, I just realized that in our um, our notes, it was going to be Kelly going next. Um, so um, Ellen, is it okay if I slot Kelly in? Sure. I don't want to. I hate, I, you I you am a go planner. Ahead, you go ahead. <laughs> so I well, would hate to go out of order. Yes. Well, thank you um, for having me. I feel I'm very honored to be part of this wonderful group and um, be connected with the Fairfield Friends again. Um, I had a wonderful experience, um, like Nicole, a great experience. I was a class of 81. It's hard to imagine that our 40 year anniversary was this year. It's coming up this year, but um, I was really fortunate. I was at poli -Sci. I had a lot of great teachers. I understand the, uh, Dr. Weinstein, you're in Donnarumma Hall. He was one of my professors and he was really instrumental in helping me like Nicole said, back even back 40 years ago, it was very open door policy. He really was helpful with the cigar, telling me, uh, you know, giving me advice because I didn't have any in my family that was a lawyer. And then Dr. Katz was another professor that was really instrumental in helping me kind of navigate what I was going to be doing going to law school. And then um, I had a wonderful English professor, uh, Artie Real. And in fact, I saw today that I had his handbook still in my desk of how to write a proper letter and proper grammar. And I saw that I was in the uh, Northwood, Northwest dorm and I had it in my book here where I was. But I, um, I had a great experience with the whole philosophy of, of Jesuit was uh, education was really instilled in, in, in uh, when I was there. I know it is now too, but, uh, but uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Katz, and question about women that have uh, had had an influence, particularly in helping on the journey. I will say, really, the class of the women in our class, 
Laura Inserno, as I see Laura's on the, in the panel. She, amazing woman that, uh, that I was in class with um, and the other women that were in our class, I think really is what helped uh, navigate me through the journey. Uh, our, even though I'm living in Dallas, Texas, um, we have a very close group. We see each other all the time and we connect even though it's 40 years later, which I think says a lot about the school um, and the values of the school. Um, but there are a lot of very strong, um, smart women in the, our class and, and Janet, who's here, they are not showing her face, but uh, is uh, well, another one in the class right behind us. So I really feel fortunate with that. I, um, I live in Texas. I have four sons that are all in their twenties. And um, for years, my sons always told me, you work too hard, mom, I'll never go to, I don't never want to be a lawyer. And now I have three of them in the, are lawyers or soon to be lawyers at um, <laughs> George Washington, Brooklyn Law and uh, a California Western yeah. in Cal uh, San Diego. So, um, you know, it just opened up a lot of doors for me and I really appreciate it. All thanks to Fairfield really got me in the right direction. Thank you very much. And Ellen. Yeah. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ellen Morgan. And uh, I'm class of 1989. Uh, my experience was a little bit different. These, my sister council lived on campus. I was a commuter student. So I lived at home. Uh, I went to Fairfield because my father worked at Fairfield. This was back in the time when that was one of the perks of working at a university was that your kid could go to the university. So I, was in class with a lot of other professors' kids, which was always a lot of fun when they were in the same class with their parent. Um, I understand that that's a little bit different now, but it, it, it was a little bit different because I didn't live on campus. I worked while I went to school. So I would go to, I would go to campus, I'd go to class, and then I'd turn around and leave. So I didn't do a lot of the extracurricular activities, uh, just because I had to go to work that day. Um, but I have to say, I, I did enjoy it. I spent a lot of time in Nicholas because that's where the psychology department was lo located. So we were down campus a little bit. And so a lot of the you know other places on campus where everybody would hang out was um, just not there. I mean, all the science students, we were all down in that science building. So. Uh, but it was it was a lot of fun. We we had a lot of good times, and and I did enjoy my time there. Um, I forgot what was the second part of the question. Oh, just if there were any um, uh, whether peers or staff or faculty that you found to be mentors in your time at Fairfield. Mm, it was my religion professor who got me into thinking about going to law school, encouraged me to apply, told me where to apply, and I cannot remember this man's name to save my life. It began with an R. He's long since passed, rest his soul. But um, he was one of the most open, genuine people I met on campus. And he, he I, I guess he saw something and he said, you know what, you ought to go to law school. And here's where you should go. And when I got to Tulane, because that's where I went, there were a lot of kids from Fairfield University down there. So I thought he was getting a little kickback or something. Oh, that's good. I kept running into people. <laughs> Great, wonderful. So it sounds, I mean, everyone of course had a wonderful experience. It sounds like, you know, campus was and is now still chock full of um, uh, wonderful uh, mentors, myself excluded, of course. Um, but what I wanna do now is just really quickly um, turn things back. And, and we were talking before we started a little bit um, and, and I do know that um, I'm looking right now at a copy of The Mirror, week of March 31st, so literally came out today. And for those of you who can read it, uh, it mentions, of course, that this is the 50 years of women at Fairfield. And so what I was wondering, and we'll start with, um, with Ellen and with Kelly, and then move on to Nicole, um, just some thoughts, right? Regardless of... Um, the question I put to you earlier, right? I want you to answer it the way you like. Just what are your thoughts on having been either part of the earlier wave of women on campus? Um, what it was like, um, the way I would phrase 
ways it was sort of, you know, paving the way for other women at campus. And then Nicole, what was it like to sort of be the inheritor of that and then pass it along to future women stags uh, who have come after you? So we'll start with Ellen and then to uh, Kelly and then to Nicole. I am gonna guess that my class was probably 50-50. I mean, there were a lot of women that were already there. And I did, when I was there, I did not realize that we were new. None of the professors thought it was unusual to have large classes of women. Um, none of the priests thought it was unusual to see a large body of women in their classes. So I guess the, the earlier classes, the earlier women, they really did a, a great job because I don't recall experiencing a lot of gender differences. I do recall there not being enough lady before them though. Mm -hmm. Great, Kelly? Well, um, I, I think it says a lot about uh, Fairfield because I too felt like very welcomed um, even though, like I said, I'm close to the 50 mark of uh, anniversary, I do feel like that, um, that I, I feel like they just were not, uh, not judgmental or non accepting. In fact, um, I was on the swim team at Fairfield and it was a co ed team. And so it was pretty funny because we swam against all the uh, small schools, Vassar, and we different places. And uh, if a woman came in, ahead of the man, we got more points. It was a co-ed team, so it was really fun. And the same thing on the sailing team I was on, we women and men were both on the sailing team. So I, I really thought that um, uh, even uh, in 77, when I went to Fairfield, 1977, that it was just um, a given that we were gonna be treated the same. So it was a great feeling of welcoming, so. Wonderful, so a welcoming campus. Yes, yeah. very Jesuit. Yes, yes, Nicole. Yeah, I have to say I, I'm i very lucky that I never really had to even think twice about the fact that there was women on campus, right? Um, so I, I, I give props to those who came before me, even if they didn't notice it either. And that's obviously a great thing. So uh, yeah, I, I can't say that there was anything that stood out to me and that's a good thing. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, Kelly mentioned Jesuit values, and I do think that that's an interesting place for us to move next. I will also I remind um, all of the folks in the room as well, but especially my students, whose names I recognize and can see, um, that you are, of course, encouraged to submit questions for us um, to ask, because uh, I love hearing myself talk, um, but I guarantee the panelists would like, rather hear you. Um, hear your questions, hear your voices. So I'll bump on to this next one, but um, cross my fingers, hope that uh, we can move on to some student and some audience questions soon. Uh, but go back to Jesuit values. Um, Jesuit values teach us to be women and men for others. Um, and I'm curious how Fairfield prepared you for your legal career specifically um, and sort of working with and serving others. You know, did, you know, the Fairfield values, the Jesuit values, did they find their way into um, how you came to law, which area of law you chose to practice? Um, and so forth. And I don't think we started with uh, Kelly yet. So we'll start with Kelly. Oh, sure. Well, I, um, it had a huge impact on personally for me. Um, I, uh, the Jesuit values, I started off um, as a tax lawyer um, and um, employment lawyer. Uh, and I, you know, started off with, um, and I always said I didn't want to do anything but family law. You know, I, I really liked doing tax work. And, um, and, but then I started doing, uh, start off early in my career doing pro bono work for victims of family violence. Uh, and I, I um, volunteer doing that and volunteer working with elderly and uh, in addition to my tax practice practice. And then uh, there would be people that clients would say, oh, she does pro bono work. She can help you on your divorce. And so then he would come down the hall. Um, I had that, like, I work with the oldest law firm in Dallas. And so I would get all these corporate clients coming down to talk to me about their divorce because I was doing so much pro bono work. Um, and then I just really enjoyed the feeling of helping others in this way. And uh, then it uh, then uh, nicely it evolved to making money. And then I you know started my own firm with um, two other women. And and uh, and it was all due to the pro bono work that I had done. And that was you know that was a great feeling of helping victims of family violence and just turned 
uh, you know, a change, life changing for me personally. Okay, wonderful. So. Um, and uh, Nicole and then Ellen. Sure. So I was a resident of Loyola Hall my sophomore year. And Loyola has like a resident program, I guess you could call it, where really you're living the Jesuit ideals. And that was really my first experience with that. I didn't, I went to public school pre previously, so I wasn't really part of a Catholic education before. Um, so I, I was really interested in that, you know, the ideals of who am I, whose am I, and who am I called to be. And that was the first time we, that was introduced to me. Um, so, you know, I got to attend a retreat at that time, learn about other people's stories and struggles and really recognizing how blessed I was in a lot of respects. And, and that self-reflection and learning to reflect on myself really set me up for success later in life, I found, um, you know, especially going to law school, practicing law and counseling clients. Um, as someone who doesn't really litigate and go to, go to court often, my main practice is sitting down and listening to my clients' struggles and what they're going through and really gearing myself towards, you know, counseling them in a way that works for them and makes them feel heard and, and um, you know, being a calm and stable presence in their lives. So, you know, generally speaking, my time at Fairfield and the Jesuit values really just continue to push me out of my comfort zone and grow as a person. I really think that did set me up for success. Wonderful. Uh, Ellen. Well, like Nicole, uh, the Fairfield was my first experience with Jesuit uh, values. Um, I am not Catholic. So this was the first Catholic school that I had ever gone to. And I found it interesting. Um, it was very similar in my own faith tradition. And ironically, I went from a Catholic school to a Jewish law school because Tulane was <laughs> is, is, is a, founded as a Jewish law, a Jewish school. But I would say that with all of that, it all flowed through uh, the reinforcement of my own faith tradition, which led me into going to le work for legal aid, going to work for town government, now in private practice. I represent a lot of children. I represent a lot of people who are mentally ill. So it, it all kind of flowed, helped that flow of service in what I'm doing right now. Great, thank you. All three just different and wonderful applications of Jesuit values and service to others. Um, we do have one question uh, from the audience which is um, about, uh, it's a, it, the intersection, I suppose, of, um, of women and law school, which is how are women perceived and treated in law school? Um, and who, who, do we not, who do we start with last, I believe? Who I would last? start with you, not, not me. Okay. Um, so I think probably to Nicole and then to Ellen and then to Kelly. Okay. Sure. Um, so I'd kind of speak about this as it also relates to practicing laws of women, um, because I think they, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, you know, as the youngest panelist, I, I would have to say that I, I hope that as the years have gone on, if the other panelists have experienced gender bias or anything like that, it's gotten even better as, as we've aged. But um, a lot of, you know, our colleagues are still a, a lot older, so they may not feel the same as someone like a millennial as myself would, right? So I do still experience some, some comments, uh, even if they're not malicious, that, you know, it, it just, it makes me think, wow, you know, there, there are still some thoughts that women are, I don't want to say lesser, because I don't think anyone really thinks that anymore. I hope not. But it, it does make me question, right? And um, in law school, I would say, professors are so forward thinking that, that that's not as big of an issue, but in, in the legal profession, you come across a lot of other people. So I don't know if people have heard of the term mansplaining, but it happens often to me. And that's really just, you know, typically an older gentleman speaking to me and saying, you know, explaining to me something that I know very well because I practice it every day. I, I definitely look to the older generation for guidance. I don't know everything. I absolutely never think that I do. 
but the fact that that I need to remind them, that's great, but I knew that already. Thanks for explaining it to me or making a comment on how young I look, um, which I think really goes hand in hand with being a woman. You know, male, my, my male colleagues at the same age, they don't get comments like that. No one will comment on how they look, their age, my height, anything like that. You know, I've gotten many, many comments. Are you old enough to be a lawyer? That no one really says that to men, to men. I've found at least all the men I practice with. So it, it's something that still comes up, even if it's not malicious. So something just to think about. I want to say these things because if there's men in the audience, something for you to think about too, right? Little comments like that may be fun and, and nice, but women experience that type of somewhat bias all the time. So always something to think about. Um, you know, and also I, I've had to explain recently to my newest male partners, like, I can't just go into a meeting and smooth talk my way through it. I get actually questioned, like, do I know what I'm talking about? And I have to prove that to people often. I don't know if my, my panelists have experienced the same thing, but I can't just get away with being a slick talker and going, I got to actually know, know what I'm talking about to impress people. And I think that has to do with being a woman sometimes. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Um, I've had less of the gender, but I do remember back when I first started, there were judges who frowned upon female war, uh, female attorneys wearing pants into court. Um, in law school, it was uh, probably 30, 70% male to female uh, professors. Uh, they had more issues than the students did because the class was so was big enough that our women percentage was a much higher percentage than the actual female percentage of the faculty. So I, I think they got over that. They were just focused on other things as opposed to gender. Uh, but in actual practice, yeah, uh, you women are not still not allowed to smooth talk your way through stuff. Um, there are still some judges who will treat women differently. And I find actually more of that from female judges than from male judges, which is always a phenomenon that kind of like, uh, you remember being a lawyer, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Um, but, you know, I kind of put that down to robitis for, you know, it's, it's counsel already knows, you've, you've seen that a million times. Uh, so I, I will have to say, yeah, you, you women attorneys still have to walk in knowing what they're doing. But after you've been around for a while, that level of respect, boom, it's already there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Kelly. I would uh, you know, agree with both my panelists uh, in terms of their, you know, what e has evolved. I think professors in general, like you, Dr. Weinstein, they're not, they don't come with that bias. So I didn't experience that in law school, but I will say that um, there were a lot of great women before me that I appreciate, you know, paving the path for, even though I've been practicing since 81, um, I mean, since uh, 84, 90, 1984, is that, um, is that it was a lot of rejection, a lot of rejection, finding employment. Uh, I, um, I would say, they, if it wasn't for the value of perseverance that I learned at Fairfield, uh, you know, despite having good grades and working hard, it was very hard to find a job. Um, and so, uh, and so that was a challenging part to back in the eighties. Um, but, um, but I will say that, um, I was, uh, going to a jury trial, uh, with my first child 20, 27 years ago, 28 years ago. And, um, the judge wouldn't let me go to trial because I was pregnant and he thought it would be biased against the jury if I was representing a male and I was pregnant. Um, and so it's hard to imagine that that happened, but he, uh, the other side filed a motion for continuance to um, prevent me from having jury help because I was pregnant and the court granted it. Uh, so it's, it's kind of weird to, you know, it's kind of odd to think that's true, but I think there's some indirect discrimination that we, you know, like Nicole and Ellen pointed out that you see without really being said, you know, having to prove yourself and do more work harder. Um, I think starting off with a female firm really helped us because we got rid of all that um, nonsense, um, all that, you know, the stereotypical stuff. 
Um, that's not to say I, I haven't had to um, um, be really assertive with males that are, you know, that are put them in their place. So I mean, it's the only way to kind of really do it and prove themselves like you ladies both said. So uh, we still have a no pants policy here in Texas. They of course prefer women to wear dresses, you know, skirts and is in some courts. But I think what's really helping evolve the practice of women is judges. You know, seeing the new judges being appointed uh, in the uh, federal courts and the state courts and local courts have really helped promote our practice because um, because it adds more, you know, just more well-rounded. But I do think sometimes, um, I think that sometimes the generation of women, like Ellen Salt, you know, be, uh, that sometimes you see women being hard on women too. Uh, and I, I, I've, I've experienced that. I think it seemed like that was women that were five years ahead of me, I experienced. But then I, I think that was just part of educating them that, like, hey, I'm, I'm just like, you know, I'm just working hard like you and kind of having to prove yourself to them too. And once that happens, then it goes away. But it is, um, you know, like I think like both the other panels said, kind of proving yourself repeatedly is the way you have the greatest success, showing them you know what you're doing and working hard. But uh, perseverance has played a big part of the um, trying, to, um, trying to be employed, you know, and a lot of rejection, but, you know, keeping, not giving up, so. Mm. Yes, and we're hoping, of course, in the next fifty years of certainly women at Fairfield, just women in the practice of law, that this sort of thing doesn't 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 keep happening, right? That that the idea of having to prove yourself um, right. just is uh, becomes a dinosaur, like so yeah. many other dinosaurs. Right. Well, I will say the interesting thing is, is we have we've had many pregnant uh, partners in our law firm that are women is dealing with maternity leave and time off, um, because it used to be that women used to have to you know, not talk about those things, but being really transparent. You can't always have everything at the same time. You can't be super lawyer and, you know, you know, you just need to balance what works for you at any given time, but kind of talking more and, and understanding that people need to take blocks of time for leave if they need to care for their family or an elderly parent um, and um, be able to come back in the practice with the same level of compensation um, and, and, and level of the firm without losing so-called track, a partnership track, you know, making it uh, coming back in the practice, not a step backwards, but a, a step forward because it makes you a well, better, well-rounded person to help your clients knowing that you've had other life experiences. Perfect. That, that, still, has, that still has not been resolved, though, I think in general, women practicing taking mm -hmm. leave for Yeah. I I has, hasn't that. been resolved. <laughs> I, I haven't quite gotten there yet. And it's probably my biggest concern as a female attorney is what's going to happen. Right. So yes, right. it's yeah. positive seeing other attorneys do it. So let's hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll pave the way. Yes. Well, we, so actually in the great thing is we now have lots of questions uh, from the chat. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to sort of summarize a few of them and try to lump them together. Uh, so there certainly are a couple that deal with uh, law school. So advice for people who are considering law school after graduation about your journey, decision to go to law school, um, and then sort of what class is best from Fairfield, best prepared you for law school. Um, and we'll start with Ellen first. You know what? I'm going to say my English classes. <laughs> my English classes. They taught me how to read critically. They taught me how to write well. And those are two of the biggest skills every lawyer needs. It doesn't matter what area of law you are in. If you cannot write a persuasive sentence, you could be as brilliant as the sun, you will lose. So I'm gonna say my English classes really did help. So for all your English professors out there, good job. <laughs> Great, uh, and then either to Nicole or to Kelly. Political science for me, I was great. Uh, English would be uh, right a second, a close second, but uh, that was really helpful. And I guess you had another part of your question. Too. I mean, uh, yeah. what else? Right. Um, uh, I, yeah. The other question was sort of um, your advice for people considering law school. If you can talk about your own decision, you know, why you chose to go, and right. a bit about more of your okay. journey. So I didn't. Go ahead, Ellen. You can. I didn't want to cut you off. Oh no 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 no. That's good. You reminded me because I completely forgot that part of the question. Um, it was recommended that I go. Uh, you know, I'm a senior. They're like, uh, you should go to law school. Okay. 
I really did kind of fall into it. I never planned to be a lawyer. Like a lot of lawyers that I know, we all wanted to be doctors, but you know, the chemistry and the, <laughs> you know, and the math kind of killed us. So we all went to law school and it just kind of flowed. And then it, once I started on the, on the process, it was, it was a real natural calling. And I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is what I should be doing. Okay, uh, Kelly. Um, mine was by uh, was air. I didn't get a job that I wanted uh, in a uh, when I was looking for jobs. I got a lot of rejections, so I thought, what am I going to do? And I didn't have any other family members. But also um, at the time, Father Kelly had just become our president at Fairfield, and he was kind enough to write me a recommendation. Um, and so, in the and the professors helped Donna Ruma and uh, in the political science department really encouraged me to like to do to do something to try to apply to law school so I was um it just it really worked out good because I didn't have any lawyers in my family but I do think also what helped is um with the with even in the practice and trying to go to law school is to is get the experience in a law firm even if you're um all my sons have worked at the law firm in the summertime if they didn't have a job they were working here so, uh, which was great because uh, they're going to be joining us soon here um, as uh, is getting experience. Even if you have to work for uh, below minimum wage or free is to tell the law firm, hey, I'll work for you for a couple of weeks. If you think I'm valuable, pay me. Uh, and, and then really work hard, be the first person at the office and the last person to leave. And, um, but, you know, work, work for nothing to get your foot in the door, to get that first experience. And I think that really helped uh, give me a better insight, the practice of law. I had a professor that helped me get that first internship, you know, for nothing, but uh, it really opened my eyes to the law, uh, a little bit broader spectrum and gave me some better direction. Wonderful. Nicole. Yeah. yeah. So to be honest, I, I would say that one of my the, the most out there classes that I think would be helpful is art history. And the reason I say that is because you're analyzing something out of the norm, right? You're looking at art, you're looking at also art relating to history and the teacher goes, tell me what you, what you see. And it's, it's so out there that it really does, it, it's more than politics, it's more than English and, and it kind of puts you out of your comfort zone, which is a lot of what law school is. You're out of your comfort zone learning totally new concepts and, and taking classes that are really difficult. So why not, you know, stretch your ring, wings while you're in undergrad? I also think, you know, part of my, my favorite part about Fairfield was that I could do multiple things and not just politics. I was an art minor and I was an Italian studies minor. Mm. And I really enjoyed those two aspects of my education because it, it allowed me to do something that I wouldn't be doing in the future, right? I, call, I called my, my art minor, it seemed like a waste of time, but it kept me sane, right? It, it let me do something creative and made me happy. And I think that's a lot of something that people aren't thinking about. They're like, I need to get to law school. What are the, the politics in these classes I need to take to get there? That's a that's an interesting mindset to have. Like this is your time to enjoy yourself as well and learn new things. And even if it's creating a hobby, and I think that might sound weird and counterintuitive, but it also diversifies your resume. Let's put it that way. You know, it's something to talk about when you're in an interview. It's something to say when you're on your writing your application. So think about things like that as well. Um, I went to law school with a doctor, a veteran. I went to law school with these people who are so distinguished and multifaceted. And I was just coming in straight from Fairfield, like, hey, I'm a politics major like everybody else, right? What, what are you going to do to diversify yourself? So that's something I want to point out. Um, and then like, if you want to be a lawyer, follow your dream. Don't let anyone tell you that, you know, it sucks being a lawyer. Everyone's going to say that. Everyone says it about every job. Let's be honest. No one likes working. So if someone says that to you, don't get discouraged. I know a lot of people that have gotten discouraged. People said that to me. I still did it and I'm happy that I did it. So if you want to go, you know, go for it. And that's, that's what I have to say. That's wonderful and inspiring. It actually gives me a very quick lightning round, just sort of fun question. 
And then we'll get back to um, Jared's question from the chat about how you picked a law school, how you narrowed things down. But I'm actually curious. So Nicole, it sounds like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the class that you had that maybe led to a hobby or like the, the, the passion class that you took, you know, seems like it was art history. Is that, would that be correct? Yeah, I think art history was a, a really nice combination of all of my joys. Art, mm -hmm. um, history, and Italian studies. <laughs> so I got it all in one. Um, okay. So yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, was there a favorite like particular class you remember? Uh, I don't recall the name of the class. It was like an intro to art history, and I took it up in Bellarmine Hall, like in the in the in the art. We were sitting around art, so it was really inspiring. Mm -hmm. I really loved it. Wonderful. Uh, and then either Ellen or Kelly, do you have a sort of a, a hobby or like passion class that you took that still stands out to you? Um, Ellen, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to say my favorite class, the one that I still reflect, I, I actually still use the information, non-traditional religions in America. Because it, it did just broaden my horizons to what was really out there. And learning something new, something different. I, I still encounter, I can still tell you, you know, uh, stuff from that class I've actually used in court. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, your honor, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to think of it this way. You can think of it this way, just like so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. And the judge would be just thrown off and go, okay, it made sense. I'm going with it. Cause I, yeah, but it, it was one of those classes that really just broadened your horizons. Um, Russian history was interesting. That kind of gave me a little insight into how people think, which is, given what I do, kind of important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm going to say those two Ooh, were cool. my passion ones. Yeah, and Kelly. Well, I hope I can still keep friends with my panelists because I'm really enjoying get to know everyone on it. Um, I was gonna, I'm gonna say, Ellen, we've got a lot in common because uh, my religion class was what uh, my, mine too. At the time I was at Fairfield, it was taught by an ex-priest and he taught atheism. So I, I too, like Ellen, have, have used that in my trials, the things I've learned from diversified different types of religion. And so it's interesting that that, and I was like shocked that here in the seventies, I was having a ex-priest teach you know, uh, atheism, agnostic uh, religions and uh, in viewpoints. And I really was been impressed that, you know, again, back in the 70s, that a uh, Jesuit school was having a class about that. Um, so it really stuck out in my mind. And it just goes to show that whole philosophy of uh, not judgmental, uh, open to perceptive to other viewpoints was really, uh, uh, was really in place back in the 70s. So I, but religion, the same class, I, it was really fascinating to me. That's wonderful. And the student, I mean, actually everybody here, whether you're a student or you're an alum or you're a parent, um, everyone has maybe that class. And so it's mm -hmm. kind of nice to reflect back on those classes that sort of changed who we are or gave us these extra skill sets we didn't think we had or needed. Um, so I want to jump on to something that one of our students has asked, which is essentially boils down to when you're picking a law school, right, there are a lot of things going into your head, right, geography, cost, stuff like that, but um, it seems that he's particularly interested in defending religious liberty, so he has a clear passion, right, so picking a school based on program or location or like, what, what helped you, what led you to sort of picking the schools that you picked, um, and we'll start with Kelly this time. Well, um, well, I thought I was going to go to Georgetown Law School, uh, and my my parents were going through a divorce at the time and so i but my whole family had gone to georgetown the brother kelly was going to write the recommend wrote the recommendation i had only applied to georgetown thinking i was going to um going only going to go there great grades i did everything right you know and um and then i got waitlisted and so i had to quickly apply somewhere else that um that would accept people at the last minute uh and it was in texas I had never even been to the state of Texas, uh, but I applied uh, there last minute and it wasn't a prestigious school that I went to. It was St. Mary's in San Antonio, um, but um, it really was, again, for me, it was life-changing, made me, forced me to be uh, humble 
uh, and I really appreciate the fact that I did get into a school. It wasn't my choice of schools I got into. Um, and I had the path of which way I wanted to go. And I was going to go to Georgetown. I was going to live in DC and I had worked for Ronald Reagan. This is where I was going to go. You know, I was, this is, I was going to be in DC in politics. And, and so it was really devastating the rejection. Um, I did find out, uh, you know, 20, 30 years later that I got off the wait list, but my parents had already moved me here and they didn't tell me, uh, that I'd gotten in and I could have gone, but I didn't have the resources to, to, uh, go. They didn't have the money to have me move again. Um, but it made me, uh, very humble in terms of having to really have to be at the bottom of the tier of schools that wasn't a prestigious law school to have to, um, work a little harder to, um, you know, to, to get the job, to, you know, to persevere in the practice. So it was, so I do think that um, why people get all caught up in the right school or the right location, it's really what you do with it. Um, and working, like I worked myself through school because I had to take out student loans. So I, you know, so I, um, it really helped me. The experience of that helped me. I didn't graduate at the top of my class. I always laugh because my husband is an attorney and he was at the top of his class. So I, I was at the bottom of my class, uh, but it, it really is, it's really what you do with it when you get out. And, you know, if you can't afford a school, you know, don't get saddled with a bunch of debt thinking I've got to go to school because it's so prestigious. Um, it took me a long time to pay off my student loans at my school. You know, it's really better more to start working right away for, in my experience was working, getting the experience was what I had to fall back on because I didn't have the other. So don't get discouraged if you don't get the, what you think you really want to go is what I'd say. And we could go back and I could list those awards again, if you want all those things you earned. Oh, I got lucky. So I get lucky. Which, it speaks to the caliber of the people that we have here. Um, so let's, uh, uh, I, I'm terrible with remembering who went last. Um, so either Ellen or uh, Nicole, um, do you have any advice for people of how you picked your schools? Uh, my professor told me which schools to, to apply. I think back when I took the LSATs, they would take your grades and they would farm them out to schools. These schools would accept you with these grades and, and this LSAT score. So I think that's where um, some of my applications went. I picked law schools based on geography. Uh, I only applied to law schools that had a NFL team in the city. <laughs> That's great. Big NFL fan? Big NFL fan. So oh, you I, and I are going to be friends. That was literally how I picked the school. Because, you, you know, go. somebody says they want to work for this, they want to work for that. You know, everybody takes the, the first year law school is the same for every law student yep. in the United States. It's the same stuff. And the second year, you get to diversify and pick what you like. And then that third year, you're making up all the classes because you know that they're going to be on the bar exam and you didn't take the class. <laughs> so true. So true. So it really doesn't matter what school you go to. You know, there's the old joke is like, what do they call the guy who graduated last from his medical school? They call him doctor. You know, it's <laughs> the, it is the same thing. It only matters what you you do with what everybody else in the same boat has been given. Great. Nicole? Yeah, um, I'll definitely chime in on that. I, I was looking for a law school where I could possibly live at my parents' house, save a little bit of money. They were in New Jersey. I didn't get into the New Jersey schools I wanted to. So I got into a, a few other schools and actually um, got... Some, some money to go to some schools and chose a school I did not get as much money for. So that's probably my biggest regret. Although I loved Quinnipiac, it has a great, and I know, you know, Fairfield students are in Connecticut. So you may be looking at Quinnipiac just because of your location, which is why I'll comment on it. It has a great atmosphere at Quinnipiac. It really is less aggressive and um, uh, competitive as a lot of other schools might be. Um, it's a great middle, middle range school. So I recommend it fully. I think my biggest issue is student loan debt. So if I was going to give you any sort of like how to pick a law school tip, it's 
do really great on your LSATs, go to a, a school that will work and give you money um, that's reasonable because it's a huge burden on my life. And if you can avoid that, I'd love it. Um, so finding someplace and, and maybe not that you have to travel far distances to go see family or, you know, move far distances. I know that my panelists have done that. So, you know, any way you can save a little bit of money, like they said, I, I was an honor roll student at Fairfield. You go to law school and you're with all the other honor, honor roll students, if not better, and you're just one of many now. And I was not the top of my class. People in the top of my class, they got these prestigious jobs that they thought they wanted and they hate them, <laughs> most of them. I went small firm, worked my way up, worked for free, just like some of my panelists did. And I am just as successful as they are, right? You don't need to be the top of your class. You don't need to be at the most prestigious school. If you're doing what makes you happy and um, you, it, you're gonna be successful and that's, so don't worry too much about where you go. It's where, where you wind up. Wonderful. Um, and how are we on time? we got some time. Okay. Um, so one of our students is asking um, the most challenging experience you had in law school, right? So whatever that could have been, um, maybe what was it? And then how did you overcome it? What advice would you give to a student overcoming maybe their first, their first challenge once they get to law school? I'd, I'd love um, to start on that if that's all right. Yeah, please. Just jumping right in. Um, I, it was honestly, after my first year, my 1L year, it's when we were all looking for our first job, right? Trying to get that law firm experience. I actually had gotten a job and I was working and I was working for free, but it, it transitioned into paying, which was great. Um, but I was trying to diversify and get another job during the school year so I could learn at a different firm. I went there, I interviewed, and I was torn apart. I cried the whole way home. And I almost quit law school at that point. I was like, how am I gonna do this? I, I can't, I'm, I'm not, we're never gonna get a real job. I'm never gonna be an attorney. I can't even get through this interview. And that was a real eye opener for me because first year, that's the year they weed out the students, right? They wanna see who's really there. It's the hardest year. So I was like discouraged over discouraged over discouraged. And then I, I really just put on my big girl pants and was like, this is it. I, I got to stay and like really make the best of this. So I'd say don't get discouraged when some one person tells you you can't do it because that's it's just not true. It's not. You can do it. Great. Um, Kelly, do you have any advice for the first real hurdle that you hit? I, you know, I think time management is important, but I kind of going back to Ellen too, location of where you go to school is, it, it can be enjoyable if you, there's other things you like in the city or close to family or something like that. Um, having never been to Texas, I, I was having a great time <laughs> in the state because a wonderful state, uh, but uh, you know, just, just managing your time. And, and again, like Nicole said, not being discouraged if you do poorly, because it's not indicative how you're going to do. They say the people that graduate the top of their class, they all become, they all get the jobs on uh, in New York City or, you know, big, big, big laws, they call it now. And, um, uh, and, and then they later become uh, judges, which I think is what I've seen repeatedly in my, you know, 20 plus years of practice, five years of practice. Um, the B students uh, become the transactional lawyers. The C students, which I would be in myself as a C student, we become family lawyers. I think we're the happiest. So, you know, uh, so it's, it's interesting how your life evolves. So it, it all works out. It, don't give up is what I'd say. Don't give up. Okay. And Ellen. We had a similar saying at Tulane. The A students became law professors. The B students became judges. And the C students made the money. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, my biggest hurdle had nothing to do with gender. My biggest hurdle in law school was a culmination of events that took place at the same time. We had a brand new dean. It was the largest class of black students the school had ever had. It was 44 out of a class of 300. Wow. The prior year they had four. 
because we had a new dean, they admitted more black students. So there was a lot of racial unrest my very first year of law school because the school had never had that many black students. And the other students were not happy at having all those black students. Wow. So that was my biggest hurdle was making it through that first year to, so that I can get to year number two. I'm so sorry to hear that. But I, it, was, it was an unusual year, but it was also an unusual class because we also had the largest class of non-traditional students, people who didn't come straight out of college. I would say about 40% of the people in my first year class had had previous occupations prior to going to law school. So I went to school with a lot of retired people. I went to school with veterans like some of the um, other panelists have had, um, people who were on their second or third degree, a couple of doctors I went to school with. So it was an unusual class in a lot of different ways. And that unusualness was the thing I had to get over. Now, the good thing about it was I didn't know any better outside hmm. of the issue of the race and the you know people walking around marching with signs and stuff. Um, the, the composition of the class and how things worked, since it was the first time I'd ever gone to law school, I thought it was always like this. So I didn't think of it as a hurdle. It was only after I left that I was like, wow, that was a lot to get over. Hmm. Yes, that was a lot to get over. Um, we have one, essentially one minute left. So I hope I can beg people's indulgences to sort of do one quick lightning round of maybe 30 second answers of if you would, if you could leave the audience with one piece of advice or one sort of um, thought about how Fairfield sort of, uh, what the gift that Fairfield gave you that you can then give forward sort of in your law practice. Um, I guess, what would it be? And again, you didn't prepare this question, so there's no pressure for grand, eloquent speeches, um, but just sort of initial thoughts. And um, I promise we can pick this up at our next event. <laughs> um, so whoever would like to go first. I would, I, I'll go first. Okay, so I would say Fairfield taught me to be well-rounded and well-educated. That was its biggest gift. Um, having a lot of different experiences with different types of people, different economic classes, um, and the Jesuit education of a well-rounded individual, that really was a gift. And that I will always cherish. Yeah, I have to second Ellen. I was, I was gonna say the same thing, just being really prepared, you know, well-rounded, you, you, are forced to take a lot of different classes. And at the time I was like, oh, what am I taking philosophy for? What am I taking religion for? I'm going to law school. It, there's a reason for it. It makes sense. And we're all you know, talking about why it makes sense today. So I agree. Yeah, I would chime in and agree the same thing. I'd also think that one thing I think resonated with Fearful too is, is kindness. There's a lot of kindness immediately on the campus. And I think that spread throughout uh, with the teachers and the camaraderie of the students, a lot of that was important. Great, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I will turn things back on over uh, to Jessica, who I believe is still here. I ah, am. There she is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Thank you to everyone who gave their time this evening to be here. The hour honestly flew by. I loved hearing all of your stories. And I hope that all of our students on the call were able to take a lot from it that they can apply as they go into their own law school journeys. And I hope all who celebrate Easter have a wonderful Easter, a wonderful Passover, the re remaining days of Passover for all who celebrate Passover. And thank you all for being here and we will see you again soon. Thank you for having us. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you.